and joining us now in studio to debate the greening of our energy grid. Joyce McLean, Director of Strategic Issues for Toronto Hydro. Jatin Nathwani, Executive Director of the University of Waterloo's Institute for Sustainable Energy. Jose Echeverry of York University's Environmental Studies Program. And Tom Adams, Energy and Environment Advisor. Uh, good to have all of you alongside for tonight's discussion. Uh, I should let you know just by way of background that one week ago tonight, we had in those seats people who had uh, a burning passion to talk about nuclear power issues, and we had a debate about the advisability of spending tens of billions of dollars in this province on new nukes. This is the companion program to that, insofar as we want you here to talk about whether or not we don't have to do that, whether conservation and maybe energy efficiency can get us where we need to be without doing that. So, to that end, sitting in that chair was Duncan Hawthorne, who runs Bruce Power, one of the biggest nuclear players in this province, and here's what he had to say about our current reliance on nuclear power. Roll tape. 50% of Ontario today is powered by nuclear plants, can-do plants. All of those plants will need to be refurbished or replaced. So there's a, you know, people like to put a big billion dollar number on this, but reality is that we have to decide, if not nuclear and not these can-do plants, then, then what? what's a credible alternative? Okay, let's put that, Joyce McLean, to you first. Government wants to spend tens of billions of dollars on new nuclear technology. If you took that money mm -hmm. and you put it into renewables or something else instead, what would be the effect? Well, I think the effect first would be a massive reshift in how we think about electricity and energy and how we power our homes and businesses, which I think is where we're at. We're at the cusp of that thinking right now. Um, Certainly from Toronto Hydro's perspective, we think that conservation is the first principle and we should be focusing on making sure that people are conserving the most they can and that our homes and businesses are run as efficiently as possible. And we would like to see the money spent there first and foremost. Jatin Nathwani, if you spent those tens of billions of dollars on greener power, could you do what we need to do to keep the lights on? I'm afraid not. I think uh, nuclear has to be an essential part of the mix. Uh, having said that, uh, uh, the direction that we're on, which is an increasing role for both uh, renewable energy resources in the province of Ontario, uh, as well as the focus on conservation, is about right. Uh, but uh, uh, given that coal is exit, uh, we will need uh, nuclear uh, for some time to come because of the role it plays in the reliability of the system. Jose, what do you say? Well, until the 1960s, we called it hydro for a reason. It came from hydropower. Now it provides 25% of the mix. We can develop renewables uh, to have a very important part of the mix. And we can have combined heat and power and district heating, which is what countries like Denmark are doing. And we can have a very different system, one that is green, good for the pocketbooks of Ontarians, and good for the environment. So if you spent those tens of billions on renewables instead of nuclear power, you could still keep the lights on. Totally, and this is a 21st century system that we should have in this country and in this province. Tom Adams, what do you say? We got some tough choices. I don't think this is gonna be easy. Um, uh, some parts are easy. We've got a, I think there's a very wide acceptance within the industry that we've gotta improve our grid. We've gotta smarten up our grid. That can make a lot of difference. Um, and we are making progress on conservation. The, you know, the, the, the consumption is going down, but the long-term trajectory probably for flat load is something that we, we've got to, to, to deal with. Can I just jump so, in? What do you mean smarten up the grid? Well, we have, when, when we built the power grid um, uh, and over time, over about 100 years, it was a, a system that was really pa a, a designed passively. The, the customer was out there being served. The customer was really not an active part of the system. They were a recipient for power. There was very little coming back from the customer. The, a green grid that has uh, information and potentially electricity flowing back and forth between the customer and the people that are producing and transmitting, distributing the power. There's a lot of opportunity there to, to, to manage the whole system better so that renewables fit better, so that conservation works better. My point is, there are a lot of good things we can do, but it doesn't get us away from some tough decisions. If coal and nuclear is out, we're, gonna, we're talking about a lot of gas. Well, I got it right here. Let's put this up, Michael. Here's the next uh, graphic we want to show everybody. Look at the monitors here in the studios. Here's Ontario's generating capacity right now. We can do over 35,000 megawatts, and here's how. We heard Duncan Hawthorne at the top of the program say half <coughs> is nuclear. 
Some people say a third. We're going with the more conservative figure, but somewhere between a third and a half is nuclear. Oil and gas, about a quarter. Hydro, about 22 percent. Coal, that's the other one we're trying to phase out by 2014, 18 percent. Wind, only three at the moment, and other, less than one percent. Jose, if we are trying to phase out coal by 2014, and you don't like nuclear, is it realistic to assume that we can replace more than half of what we rely on today to keep the lights on and people working and factories moving and so on and so forth without nuclear? Well, we need to think differently, of course, and we need to start investing seriously. So the government in Ontario has done some right things, for example, the Green Energy Act, the feeding tariffs for renewable that are soon going to be reality. <clears throat> and what we need to do is we need to emulate what is working in other countries that are at the forefront of this. Um, and I mentioned earlier Denmark. Denmark, with a population half the size of Ontario, consumes about a quarter of the power that we do here. And that is because they've taken over the, I don't know, last 20, 30 years, steps to ensure that economic growth is no longer associated with a growth on energy use. That's one thing they did, and it's only two countries in the world. Small country, though. Well, well, a tiny, small country compared to here. But there's only two countries that have done it. Uh, Japan and Denmark have been able to dissociate GDP with the growth of energy. That's number one. Number two, they made it mandatory that district heating had to be part of the way people uh, heated uh, their homes. And what this did was that it created an incentive to create combined heat and power plants. So what they do is they locate combined heat and power plants close to where the power is used and where the heat is used, because heat can be stored for a long time, you see. And then you can have a large penetration of intermittent renewables like wind. Um, in Denmark at the moment, the mix is 26% it's wind, and they aim to do 40%, Steve. Okay, but jo Tom, Joyce, Tom said a moment ago, we've got some very tough decisions we have to make here. Yes. And I guess the toughest decision is, can you really take coal and nuclear out of our energy mix and replace it with renewables and keep the lights on? Well, I think the point is that it's over time. I don't think he could just decide that tomorrow and shut everything down and uh, hope that, you know, the lights are going to stay on. That's not realistic. But I think that if we made, the, if we made decisions based on the actual cost of the technology and helped educate the average consumer and business owner, then I think that we would have a groundswell of support for renewables uh, as, the, as the base for moving forward. And if we were, in fact, to uh, change our codes so that, w so that all appliances and other equipment were at the highest possible efficiency rating, which is not the case, not even close to the case now, um, then we would see a, a sea shift happen. I mean, as, as uh, Jose alluded to, we are very wasteful in Canada in terms of, of, of our energy consumption. Still. We're still wasteful. Despite the incentives and investments that have been made in Ontario thus far, um, we're still very wasteful as, as a society, and we can do a lot more on the conservation front. And that's the cheapest form of electricity going. Conserving. Yes. Jatin. The As I said, it's, I think, not realistic nor credible. It fails a number of key tests, uh, something along the lines of, of cost, cost matters, affordability of uh, reliable, uh, cheap supply of power to uh, the people is absolutely necessary, particularly if you think about the socially disadvantaged. You say nuclear, though, is a well, uh, the, the cost of power delivered to the people of Ontario, and, and you've got to get the right mix here. The cost of nuclear is off the charts, though, isn't uh, it? It is not, if you take a balanced view of the matter. We'll get back to that cost in a moment. But let me give you the four tests that you have to meet here. Cost matters. Mm -hmm. Reliability of that power system is also important because ultimately uh, it, it deals with industry and economic growth. Uh, commercial feasibility of the uh, number of renewable energy options come into play. The notion of environmental sustainability and social acceptance is also another key feature. And if I were to take you above all that to a vision of Ontario, where if you saw this society decline in terms of depopulation, that would be one thing, but you will have three more million Ontarians in the year 20 years from now. Mm -hmm. uh, to, this is a, a modern industrial province that requires a level of energy supply and a reliability that can only be achieved through a, 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 a robust mix of supply options that ought to include a large amount of renewables and a great focus on conservation, but you can't get away without nuclear. Tom, you want to follow? When you looked at your pie, 
Um, uh, the hydro component of the Pi was almost all constructed prior to 1968. Um, uh, really, mo most of the big hydro was completed um, prior to 1955. There are a few hydroelectric opportunities in the far north. They're pretty expensive. We have to uh, um, uh, establish a good relationship with the Aboriginal people okay. that are there. Can I just make understand the, that 22 percent you think can be a lot bigger if we get into that? It can be a little bit bigger, little bigger. is my point. Um, the, the coal and nuclear slice, if we take that out um, uh, and, and we're maintaining concern about reliability, as Jatine was making uh, the point, uh, uh, cost and whatnot, Renewables can take up a slice of it, but we're going to end up with a whole lot of gas. Um, now, right now, we have the favorable position of natural gas being a very inexpensive fuel. It gives us some breathing room, some time to think. Uh, um, it's easy to build gas plants. They're, they're, well, not that easy, but they're fairly uh, quick to build. There's not a long lead time. How are they on pollution? Well, there's positives and negatives. They're a lot better than, than the old unscrubbed coal plants that we used to have. Um, on the other hand, they're, they, uh, if you look at upstream, their e emissions uh, that are, and you look at the whole life cycle, their pollution is, is better, but still not perfect. Jose, do you want to talk about those four tests that Jatine said? Uh, cost, reliability, commercial feasibility, environmental sustainability. D does your program meet that test? All of the above, and most importantly, let's talk about what matters most to Ontarians, which is money and jobs. This is the economy of the 21st century. It's based on sustainability and renewable energy yeah, and nuclear conservation. nuclear creates lots of jobs too, so... Well, not really. I mean, if you put it on a table, in any measure that you put on dollar invested or megawatt or megawatt hour, uh, the jobs are with renewable energy and conservation. They're labor intensive. They're not capital intensive. The point of the story, though, is that this is an opportunity. Say if you have a town of 10,000 people here in Ontario, each family will, 10,000 families, each family is spending $5,000 per year on energy costs to keep their house going, their car going, etc. Well, that's over one year, $50 million. And over 10 years, half a billion dollars, billion with a B as in Bob. And this is, how can we find a way that that money, money that at the moment is going to buy fossil fuels, to buy uranium, not from us here in Ontario, but from other people outside, and to top it all off, creating pollution, can, how can we keep that huge amount of money for 10,000 families? Inside in the country. Tom, the hey, look, a, a couple of issues here. In Denmark, customers are, household customers are paying almost 40 cents a kilowatt hour Canadian for power, which is about almost four times what we're paying here on average. That's, that's an issue. Another issue is this green jobs business. The electricity industry is extremely capital intensive. The renewables are very capital intensive. The, these wind power uh, um, uh, uh, um, farms that are being set up. There's not a lot of people working there. You don't see a lot of pickup trucks in the in the in the uh, in the parking lots. There's there. a bunch of folks who don't want them near where they live either. Well, th I, there are some social acceptability issues if we cite them, uh, you know, it, without being careful. But but electricity is not a place that's going to create a lot of jobs. The people that work in the power business are well paid. <coughs> they're highly trained. There's a lot of experts. But there are not that many of them, and there ought not to be. We don't want a labor-intensive power system. We want an efficient power system. Let me pick up on that. And Joyce, I want to bring you in here. We hear these terms occasionally used interchangeably, and I'm not sure they ought to be, so maybe you can help us with an explanation here. The difference between efficiency and conservation. Go ahead. Okay. Well, efficiency has to do with the ability of the equipment that you're using to run uh, at, 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 in the most efficient least energy intensive way. So for instance, there is a program, a consumer program called Energy Star that rates your fridges and those kinds of things out there. So those, uh, the, you know, and the, the idea is the lower the kilowatt hours, the better for you mm -hmm. as a consumer to purchase. Um, and the government, uh, the Ontario government, unfortunately just let a program lapse where, the, where you got a, a, a rebate on a, or a, a basically a relief on your tax if you bought an Energy Star appliance. Conservation is really about behavior though, and that's a really critical component. And that requires education, information, 
lots of material for people to grasp this notion. And to Tom's point, you know, um, about cost, I mean, it is true that Europeans pay a lot more money for their electricity, and therefore they use a lot less. Yeah, and true. this is a really critical point. And if we were, in fact, looking at the total cost of production from uh, nuclear, coal, other forms of electricity generation, we would be paying uh, a different price structure than we're currently paying now. And I think that's a really important consideration when you, when you are looking at um, moving uh, uh, equipment into a more efficient realm and talking to people about how they actually use electricity in their homes and businesses and whether they're leaving their lights on. I want to pick yeah, up on all that, that sort right of now thing. because we got, Jatino, go to you in one second. We got a graphic here, Michael, if we can bring this one up. Electricity demand in the province of Ontario. Two lines here. Going back to 1975 to present day, here's the line where we thought electricity use was going. Up until about 1989, then that recession of 1990 kicked in. Here's what actually happened. So the smart people who plan to make sure that we have enough capacity in the system thought we were going to be well, well, way up the charts. And in fact, what ended up happening was that that line kind of flattened out uh, much more dramatically than they thought. Now, Tom, we did lose 300,000 jobs over the last few yeah. years. There's no doubt that's part of the explanation. Maybe part of the explanation is conservation as well. Maybe part of the explanation is industry has gotten more energy efficient. Is that possible too? Yeah, it, it's happened across in industry. The, um, uh, you, you look at mining, forestry, uh, you, you, actually you look at the entire industrial sector and l compare their efficiency against the other major sectors, like commercial, industrial and residential. Uh, it's been the industrial customer class that's made the greatest progress in efficiency. Um, uh, it's not all been what they call load destruction when plants have been shutting down, although that's been a factor in recent years. But the trend for improvement in energy efficiency is a long-term trend, and it's industry has been carrying their load. Team. The, the point about energy efficiency is valid and good in, in that it reduces real cost of what it is that you do. Uh, one ought to still be quite wary and aware of a perverse phenomenon called the rebound effect, that the more efficient you make things, in fact, because you have reduced real cost, that the actual aggregate utilization in the economy of that particular form of uh, energy does go up. So these are perverse effects that you need to be aware of as you plan for these things. If I may also touch upon the question. Can I just, before you leave that thought, yeah. the best example there might be the car. They made more energy efficient, and as a result, people bought more gas and drove more. That's one example cited. Yeah. So it is uh, something to be quite aware of and, and, and not ignored as you, as you think about the future and trying to meet the needs in some sort of a, a, a robust way mm -hmm. that, that uh, you won't find yourself. Now you wanted to follow up. Uh, the follow-up was around conservation, of course. It makes absolute and eminent sen <laughs> how, sense. How can we not do more of it? Uh, but why can't we be also be more realistic about its, its potential? In Ontario, the results, early results are pretty good, and, and it seems uh, quite credible that, that it's something we should pursue. It comes at a cost also, which is very low. Mm -hmm. So that is something that we should pursue. Uh, but, but look out for saturation effects. Look out for, for things where the, the, uh, you need to monitor these things fairly closely over time to ensure that the results will, in, in fact, stick. And Ultimately, it's not a substitute for supply. What it does do is it introduces a great deal of flexibility into the planning system. So now the fact that you have more conservation, it relaxes the constraints on the planning. Okay, let me pick up on that. Jose, if you look at that chart and you see you expected energy use to go like this, and in fact it went like this, are you going to use that as an argument to say, look, we don't need to build all this new capacity. We're, we're going to be fine just, you know, nipping at the edges a bit. I didn't expect it. I actually think we can do much better. The point of the story is the difference between conservation and efficiency, it's behavior. And the culture of conservation that the government started to build has to become an ingrained part of the educational system of our province, the same as renewable energy. Look, the bottom line here is that to have a better province, you, pl you have to plan to have it. And you have to create opportunities. So farmers, community groups, uh, forestry operations, and the manufacturing sector can get a piece of the action. The piece of the action I described that earlier, there's this significant amount of money that we use 
to power our homes, to heat our homes, and at the moment is exporting capital away from our province. And the key thing here is how to ensure that we develop the local conditions so we can become really, really good at efficiency, that's making things better, putting sweaters in homes, making better windows, and creating power in the home, the business, and close to industry. Well, that's just it, George. How do, you, how do you make sure that people, when they say, oh, well, these cars are energy efficient right now, that we don't go out and drive more and use more gas and defeat the whole purpose of the whole thing in the first place. Well, to put it in context, since uh, 2005, Toronto Hydro's incentive programs have reduced um, the load off, our, off the Toronto Hydro grid by about 370 megawatts. And we know that that's uh, basically easy activities, but at the same time... Like what? Light bulb change-outs, okay? Um, but even so... You look around, you go to restaurants, you go to businesses, you go to people's homes, people are still using a lot of incandescent bulbs, which are much more energy intensive than uh, compact fluorescents, as an example. So even though we've made some headway, we know we have, we've barely touched the surface of the potential for conservation. So again, I come back to Jose's point about education, about information, about ingraining this in people's brains, about, um, you know, that this is, a, we're, we're talking about larger consequences. When we're talking about electricity generation, there are environmental consequences, there are societal consequences as a result of decisions that we make now that are going to last for many, many, many years. And I think that if we were better educated as consumers, we would be choosing the clean air options, the no waste options, and, and the, the least cost options, which is conservation and renewables. Tom, I guess the fear here is that planning, needless to say, is a very inexact science. And I think you and I were probably both at those press conferences uh, almost 20 years ago now, when the, uh, you know, the grand poobahs from Ontario Hydro came out and said, we need tons of new nuclear facilities yeah. in this province because look at what demand is going yeah. to do, and it never happened. Now, the other side of that is, you know, what if the economy picks up? And what if people start using more power? And what if three million people do, in fact, move here in the next 10 years? You don't want to be caught shortchanged, do you? No. It, it, the, 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 the power system has to kind of ride this knife edge. There's a lot of objectives that you're trying to optimize. And, and actually, you know, I've got a lot of sympathy for the people that have to make those decisions because uh, getting it wrong has a lot of consequences. You didn't have very much sympathy when you were with Energy Probe. You've changed a lot. You've mellowed in your old age, Tom. Uh, you know, I've I, I got, I, I got some, some sense of humility about this subject. It's a tough subject. And, 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 I, and I, it comes back to this theme, I think, that we, we don't have uh, just a lot of silver bullets available to us. Uh, Jose was making a point about cogeneration. That's a that's a great option. It, it's theoretically got a, a very enormous, very very large potential. But you look at the economics of of cogeneration for industrial customers. We know there are several good opportunities for some incremental uh, cogeneration, but for a lot of industry, it's very borderline. Then you start looking at well, at smaller scales, some of these cogeneration plants they're more expensive. They're, 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 they, the operating costs are higher. So the, the economics of cogeneration are really s still quite dicey. Jatin. The key point I want to raise is we ought not to forget recent short memory here, 2003. We pretty well got to a pretty serious crisis in electricity supply in Ontario and we had Mr. Dwight Duncan running around saying supply, supply, supply is the only answer and then you can't bring these things on in a real hurry. So as you said, the, 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 the planning of electricity supply is, is certainly not a science. There are one too many uncertainties here and you don't want to head down a path with a whole set of untestable uh, hypotheses and assumptions and wishful thinking that you think you might actually be able to deliver uh, on the basis of, uh, you know, uh, assumptions that have not well, been tested I guess out. Part of the issue is we had a pretty moderate summer here. And the previous winter, actually, was a fairly moderate winter. And as a result, we didn't use as much power. And a recession we, on top of and that. And a recession on top of that. So maybe usage is down for all of those reasons. Jose? Key thing here is to learn from those that are doing things right. And the fact is, is that the European Union as a whole has a 2020 directive to increase the use of renewable energy country by country a great deal. Uh, countries like Germany, Denmark, Spain, and so on are doing these things because they make sense for their economies. And the key thing here that I want to clarify is that building a large-scale 
centralized generation plant, be it coal or nuclear. It's a huge capital and uh, time intensive endeavor. Mm -hmm. Building uh, capacity based on renewables and combined heat and power can be done in a more modular manner. In other words, you can put things closer to where they're needed. Um, mm -hmm. You go to Markham, Ontario, for example. In Markham, Ontario, they have combined heat and power plants at the moment that were built right in the area where the next downtown of Markham is going to be. And they're going to fire those generators and store the hot water to provide hot water to all the buildings that will be built there. That makes a great deal of I sense. See lots of, everybody else wants in. Mm -hmm. Joyce, go ahead, you first. Um, well, I think that it's really important to think about this kind of thing, that we have had large central plants in Ontario and maybe it's time to look at a completely different model and do a decentralized model. So that what if, what if, for instance, every house in Toronto had the opportunity to, as part of the chattel on the house, part of the mortgage, you actually have a, um, the ability to install a solar uh, photovoltaic system on your house so that when you leave that house, that system stays with the house and it becomes part of the asset that the house would provide to the, to the next home next homeowner. You can do that? Uh, no. No bank wants to take that on right now. But it's something that, or no bank at least is publicly saying that they're taking that on right now. But I think it's certainly something that we could be considering. Just like when you move from house to house, the hot water, you don't take the hot water tank with you. Right. Um, but you could take, you could leave the solar system that you've invested in with the house as, a, as an example. I mean, that is true decentralized power. Having, um, having solar on your rooftop that basically serves your own purposes. Tom. We, we've got a lot of uncertainties. We, we're not sure what the technology of the future is going to be that's going to work best. One, so we need some no regrets uh, solutions, things that give us flexibility going forward. You want to one of the things, invest in the grid. Uh, the grid's a provincial resource. If we do, we've done, the, we've, we've, we've made technological breakthroughs in Ontario um, before. Back in the 50s, we were some of the first people to put in a 500 kV system. It really worked. People didn't think it was going to work. It did. Um, we can do it again. So you're saying invest in transmission? Put, put some money into making a smarter transmission system, not necessarily a bigger transmission system, one that works better. It'll give us flexibility to bring in the technology of the future. Certainly. The point I wanted to make about uh, renewables energy, energy sources is that there's a fundamental mismatch Apart from the fact that it is costly and it is an intermittent source of uh, energy, there's a fundamental mismatch in terms of the power density that renewable energy resources that flow through and the power density of the demand in terms of whether it's in a house, office, or, or industry. Mm -hmm. And, to, and as, you, as you begin to increase the, the uh, range of renewables in, in the system, your impacts on land use begin to increase enormously that you had not predicted, the amount of social friction that begins to show up uh, around wind that we're beginning to see that you had not predicted. So the point to make is each form of energy has its limitations and its strength. And you need to try and, and, and strive something that actually makes a, 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 the entire system work in, in, in some coherence that's Let, Let's necessary. do one more graphic here. We've got about five and a half minutes to go. And this is called the 6300 megawatt target. Th these are the targets the Ontario Power Authority hopes that we're going to hit. In 2006, Ontario set a target of reducing peak demand by 6300 megawatts through conservation and efficiency through to the year 2025. That would be equal to taking one in five users off the grid. That's a big, big, big target. A reduction of 1,300 plus megawatts has been seen to date. Okay, these targets, Tom, at all realistic? I, you know, it, in some ways you got to take these things a little bit with a grain of salt. I think it, uh, when, when we're talking about megawatts or, or power generated or power consumed, you can there's a meter on the on the on the on the generating station. There's a meter on the house. You can tell how much who's producing and where it's being consumed. But when you're talking about avoided consumption, how much gasoline didn't you use today? Uh, could you have used but you didn't? Uh, or electricity or some other uh, resource? It's very tough to tell. These numbers, are, so uh, I think, look, conservation is a legitimate uh, 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 objective. And, and the fact that we've been keeping our per capita consumption really quite flat for quite a while, actually declining in recent years, um, that's that's a step in the right direction, 
but but I mean, 6,300 okay. megawatts. Jose, let me go to you on this. The World Wildlife Fund offices just down the street, pretty green organization. They think, never mind 6,300. They think nine to 12,000 megawatts as a target for reduction is possible. Is it possible we're not being ambitious enough? I completely agree, and I think the viewers have to go to the internet and look at energynet.dk. That's the energynet.dk for and Denmark. That's for Denmark, and that's you will see a nice graph of how uh, that country deals with its electricity on a minute by minute, day by day basis. And as as I said earlier, half the population of Ontario using a quarter of the power and getting 26% from the wind right now and wanting to get, as a policy of the government, 40% uh, by the year 2020. So should we quadruple the cost of power? Well, I don't That'd think it's people necessary. To use less, wouldn't it? Well, but why be so blunt about it? I, what I want to see more <laughs> is to, to see a new system that benefits directly Ontario farmers, uh, as Joyce was saying, Ontario homeowners, um, and I have a very good example. In our house, we put a solar water heater. Manufacturing Waterloo, uh, where Jatin comes from, it now reduces the use of fossil fuel in my house for the hot waters by 40%. It was made by Ontarians, installed by Ontarians, and the natural gas that I'm saving, the atmosphere is thanking me. Let's talk about timing. This is a lousy time. No one has to be told that, right? People are focused on the economy. They're focused on... If you've got a job, keeping a job. If you don't have a job, trying to find a job. Can, can you talk to people in the province of Ontario today about conservation and efficiency when they are so overwhelmingly focused on the economy? Absolutely, because uh, they are critical hand-in-hand -hand elements. You want the economy to flourish, you need to be operating at the least cost possible. And that includes being the most efficient you possibly can. But that takes can an be. upfront investment too, doesn't it? Yes, it does, but it pays back. And, you know, I think that we need to consider how uh, businesses and homeowners look at that payback period because we know it's a challenge uh, at Toronto Hydro in talking to our commercial customers who want a payback period, payback period of two years. We think that's unrealistic. I what mean, if you're be? going to be in business for a period of time, you should be able to spread out your, your costs of investment over a longer period than two years. Uh, we know that the average um, homeowner will look at an eight-year sort of payback. That's more realistic. And if you're going to be in business for the long haul, you should be looking at that uh, as, as a reasonable rate of, uh, a reasonable way of a uh, time frame of investing. Okay. Do you think to comment on whether these targets are reasonable or not and how do you measure them and can you actually measure them meaningfully are all challenging questions. But let me bring one more in. Let's assume we can actually meet the, uh, the conservation targets and do better than we thought we were. Uh, the other key factor that you need to recognize in the Ontario system today is that the system is aging. Large amounts of the capacity of Ontario's mm -hmm. generation assets are going out of service. And now if you throw on top of that that you are not going to do nuclear, or either refurbish or build some a new one, then take coal out, you're putting the province in a degree of jeopardy that you, you won't wish to be a Minister of Energy uh, 10 <laughs> years from now. <laughs> Minute to go, Tom. Tell me this. Do you think we have the capacity to change? I've heard it around this table many times. Ontarians are energy pigs. Do we have the capacity to change people's, the way they think about using energy? We've already made great progress. Um, uh, and, and uh, the, you know, the, the trend line, the, the improvement in energy efficiency in Ontario that's gone on in the last few years started before the economy crashed. So it's not just an e economic turndown. We can make progress on the culture of conservation. Last 30 seconds, Jose. Ontario should be proud of itself. This is the only jurisdiction in the world that is trying to phase out coal. We have the best renewable energy plants and systems in North America at the moment, and we need to keep doing more. This is going to put Ontarians to work, so let's get on with this. And when in doubt, call Denmark, because they know what they're doing. <laughs> and we can be the, the Scandinavia of the Americas. We can be the Danes of Canada. Okay. Can I thank, on one side of the table, Joyce McLean from Toronto Hydro, Jose Echeverry from York University, on the other side of the table, Tom Adams, the Energy and Environment Advisor, formerly with Energy Probe, Jatin Nathwani, University of Waterloo. I thank all four of you for coming in tonight and helping us with this discussion. Thank Thanks you. so much. Thank, thank you. you. Now, for more information about tonight's guests and the latest outlook by the independent electricity systems operator on the reliability of Ontario's electricity supply in the months ahead, please visit tonight's episode page at tvo.org slash the agenda. Tonight's debate was produced by Daniel Kitts. 
And you can read Daniel's post on the World Wildlife Fund's vision for how Canadian cities could run in the future using only, only, green energy. You'll find that on our Inside Agenda Producers blog, also online at tvo.org slash the agenda.